Our text today begins in Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Verse 8. If you see in a province the oppression of the poor and the violation of justice and righteousness, do not be amazed at the matter. For the high official is watched by a higher, and there are yet higher ones over them. But this is gain for a land in every way, a king committed to cultivated fields. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. And what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? Sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. There's a grievous evil that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt. And those riches were lost in a bad venture. And he's the father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand. As he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again, naked as he came, and shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. This also is a grievous evil. Just as he came, so shall he go. And what gain is there to him who toils for the wind? Moreover, all his days he eats in darkness in much vexation and sickness and anger. Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun the few days of his life that God has given him. For this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil, this is the gift of God. For he will not much remember the days of his life, because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. Let's pray together. Righteous Heavenly Father, thank you for the many blessings that you have given us today, and thank you for this word that you have given us from King Solomon. We pray, Father, that as we consider the futility of life, uh, that we find our ultimate meaning in you. And Father, you have presented us with many good things in this world. Help us, Father, to make none of them into God, but to recognize them as blessings and gifts from your hand to be enjoyed as you have given them for the purpose for which you have given them. Help us, Father, to keep everything in its proper place. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Today's text begins with some difficult medicine. And it's, it's difficult medicine for me, uh, because you've, you've probably discerned over the course of my preaching and teaching, especially concerning the law of Moses, um, that what Solomon begins with today is, is pretty near and dear to my heart. Um, and it's not just because of that, by the way, that I happen to preach on it a lot. It just comes up a lot in Scripture. I think it's near to God's heart. Uh, as he presents it in the scripture. Solomon talks about the oppression of the poor and the violation of justice and righteousness. What Solomon says, if you see in a province the oppression of the poor, the violation of justice and righteousness, do not be amazed at the matter. For the high official is watched by a higher, and there are yet higher ones over them. And the next verse, I, the ESV has done its best. The Hebrew in verse 9 is really weird and difficult. One way of rendering it is, but there is gain for a land in every way. Yeah, this is gain for a land in every way, a king committed to cultivated fields. You can also interpret that uh, instead of talking about the king doing something good by cultivating the land. Uh, the king basically being greedy for cultivated land. So it follows on along with what has just been said, that the high official is watched by a higher, and there are yet higher ones over them. What Solomon has to say here in this passage is, is difficult. He says, look, you see injustice going on, you see the poor being oppressed, see people under the boot, 
Don't be surprised. Don't be amazed. Now, Solomon's not telling us to ignore the law or to permit oppression and injustice. Rather, he is he's telling us what we surely already know in this world, that the higher up someone is, the more incentive they have to ignore God's laws and to enrich themselves off the backs of the poor, to enrich themselves off the less powerful. And we shouldn't be surprised when we see it happen. It is more or less a law of human nature that people act this way. In fact, we have our own proverbs about this. Right? Remember what we say about absolute power? What does absolute power do? It corrupts absolutely. Right? That's the purpose of proverbs. You carry them around in your head. And that's essentially what Solomon is describing to us here. And so fitting the theme of the book, we cannot hope to find meaning or to find something of lasting worth solely in combating injustice. And there are plenty in this world who try. There are plenty in the church who try to, to make their purpose in life entirely about seeking justice for the poor and seeking righteousness in the law. And we certainly can't condemn the things that they do for the poor, the efforts that they make to, uh, to have good laws. But what Solomon is telling us is that it is a mistake to place too much hope in it, that you cannot actually make it the purpose of your life, that you cannot find meaning, ultimate meaning, in the fight for justice. Again, this is not to say that we shouldn't fight for justice. Solomon's not telling us to ignore the law. Far from it. He's telling us not to be surprised when other people ignore the law. But we cannot place our hope in justice on this earth. Because this surely is futility. This is vanity. That justice in this life is well, it's, it's ironic. I want you to think about something. Where does justice come from? If not from God himself, from his character, from his word, his very word which created the universe. Right and wrong, oppression, uh, you know, the, the definitions for these things. Oppression and freedom, these, these things are baked into creation. Right? God spoke creation into existence. And so what's right and what's wrong is baked into things. How you ought to treat people is baked into things. And we would think, well, I mean, how long does God's word abide? It abides forever. And we might be tempted to think, well, look, if... If God's word abides forever and if justice comes from God's word, then justice surely ought to be a really durable, robust thing. And yet, what we find in this life is that justice is one of the most fragile things on earth. Because what does it take to shatter justice in a place? What does it take to destroy righteousness among a people. We've, I mean, we've studied this fairly recently in our Joshua class. How many men did it take and how many deeds did it take for Israel to be condemned by the Lord? It took one man committing one act. Hey, we remember the sin of Achan. How many men does it take to shatter justice among a people? As few as one. And Solomon's telling us, oh, don't be surprised at that. One's being optimistic, right? <laughs> you look at the world, there's way more than one person getting in on this grift. The high official is watched by a higher, and there are yet higher ones over them. It's ironic. 
And it's part of why Solomon names it here. But surely this is futility. This is vanity. To place our hope in something that is that fragile, in earthly justice. And yet we can take some comfort, maybe, in the fact that the high and mighty will themselves get no satisfaction out of the wealth that they have plundered from the poor. Right? He who loves money will not be satisfied with money. Right? What are these high officials and the higher ones over them doing? What motivates them, if not money? And Solomon turns around and says, the very thing that they're engaged in is also vanity. It is meaningless, pointless, futile. They think they're going to get something out of plundering the poor, but in the end they get nothing. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. It's futility. It's pointless. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. And what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? Right? No matter what way you slice it. Right? If somebody is... is accumulating wealth for themselves, they're either also going to accumulate moochers who are going to take their wealth from them, or let's assume that they don't accumulate moochers. Let's assume that they're like a dragon sitting on their hoard. They've got all their wealth piled up and they just roll around in it, sleep on it, swim in it like Scrooge McDuck. What good is it? I mean, did it ever strike you how silly it is that Scrooge McDuck just swims in his gold in his vault? What advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? How much is that worth? It's worth nothing. In fact, this, this is what Solomon says. Sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much. But the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. And so it is futility to place our hope in justice. It's also futility to place our hope in injustice and the wealth that comes from it. Because it is futility overall to place any kind of hope in worldly wealth in any way whatsoever. Here's a grievous evil that I've seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt, and those riches were lost in a bad venture he is father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand. And there's a lot that can go wrong with your riches. As he came from his... But even if nothing bad happens to your riches in this life, right, Solomon reminds us as he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again naked as he came, and shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. This also is a grievous evil. Just as he came, so shall he go. And what gain is there to him who toils for the wind? Moreover, all his days he eats in darkness and in much vexation and sickness and anger. All of these guys that place their hope in their wealth don't even have peace in this life and certainly don't get to take their wealth with them into the next life. And so Solomon reminds us of what he's already told us several times over the course of the book. Right? If you're just considering life's material blessings in and of themselves, what's the best way to treat them? He says, what I've seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun the few days of his life that God has given him, for this is his lot. That's, that's the maximum amount of enjoyment that you can ever hope to get out of material wealth. Is just enjoy it while you have it. Again, Solomon, Solomon is not telling us to be greedy. He's not telling us to oppress the poor. He's merely putting things in perspective for us. This is all you can hope to get out of wealth. So it doesn't make any sense to try to oppress the poor. To get more and more and more because eventually you hit the limit right where all that you're chasing after is the wind and you have so much that the best you can do is look at it 
And so the call today is for us to keep our own material blessings in perspective and for us to keep the world in perspective. Right? It's really easy to get bent out of shape about what's going on out in the world. It's easy to get bent out of shape about how the poor are treated. Easy to get bent out of shape over what the rich and powerful are allowed to get away with. Easy to get bent out of shape over what we have, what we perceive ourselves to have been cheated out of. Right, we worry about as much as yeah, you know, we worry as much about what we don't have as what we do have sometimes. Solomon says all of that is futility, and the call this morning is to not make any of those things the center of your life. The call is to make the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ the center, meaning, and purpose of your life. Uh, it's funny, we were, I was talking about this with, with our Solomon before Bible class this morning. You know, we talk about meaning, we talk about purpose, we talk about satisfaction coming through Jesus Christ. I want to mention something that, uh, that I went over in today's recording that should be up on YouTube now, um, in the passage about elders and deacons. After that passage, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, Paul writes this, Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. Right, godliness, again, we typically think of pertaining to our own behavior, the way that we act according to God's pattern. And this is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. What is the mystery of godliness? What is the, what's the rule of godliness? It's Jesus Christ himself. What is hope for us? What's our meaning? What's our purpose? The thing that we center ourselves around? It is Jesus Christ himself. We call on you to place your hope in him. If you've not done so already, believe in that good news. Turn away from the life of sin. Confess Jesus as Lord and be baptized into his death, burial, and resurrection for the remission of your sins. If you're subject to that invitation, we invite you to come forward as together we stand and sing.